excited to get into the Word? You know, I don't know if you noticed, but uh, our dear sister Lindsay Hoagland's back with us. And she didn't come alone either. And I'm not talking about Jesse. Uh, as well, uh, Chris, thank you so much for the time putting into this. I think that, uh, what a great point that... Uh, you know, why, why does the atheistic community have just as much interest in our planting churches? Because of the programs that we're able to implement. CR. I mean, what, it doesn't matter whether you believe in God or not. What, what family with, with family members who are, are enslaved to drug abuse wouldn't want a, a chemical recovery program in their city? Um, and I think at the end of the day, like what we offer people are Christian principles even though they may not want them yet. Amen? But I think what an incredible opportunity to be able to clean the community and yet raise money for the churches that we're planting. Uh, one thing I, I did space is, uh, of course, next Saturday we have the men's marriage devotional. The husband's devotional. So now, wives, you're going to want to make sure you get your husband there so he can get some good discipling on being a good husband. And here's another reason why. Because husbands, you're going to be definitely sure that the following week you're going to make sure your wife goes to the wives' devotional so she gets the discipling. We all know the Bible says the wives need to submit to their husbands as to the Lord. But sisters, wives, you need to get your, your husbands there so they can be reminded that the Bible says that husbands need to take care of their wives like Christ takes care of the church. Amen? So let's make sure all the husbands will be there. Amen? Uh, you know, this morning, one of my favorite parts of the day is when I wake up or when I'm able to go in and wake up Mina from her first nap. The first time she wakes up, it's not very pleasant because she's usually enraged with hunger, hanger. But after she eats, she takes like a 30-minute nap. And then when I wake her up, she always wakes up just super happy. And I, I walk into the room, and she'll be kind of rolling around. Now she's crawling. And uh, she'll kind of hear someone come in, but she doesn't know who it is. And then I say, Mina. And then all of a sudden, just a huge smile comes over her face. And it's the best feeling. And yet... <clears throat> You know, in that moment, she's not certain about who's coming in. But then she hears my voice. Yeah. And I love it. And yet, if there's one thing, I, I share that because if there's one thing I hate, it's uncertainty. Yeah. Right? I wonder if the, the first feeling is fright followed by excitement. But, but don't you hate uncertainty? Just not being sure of something? Yeah. You know, one form of uncertainty that I hate is when I'm at a restaurant and I'm not sure what to order. Uh, yeah. I mean, I... I cannot stand that. Yesterday, me and Jay went out to Thai food, and uh, such an incredible young man, um, just fiery. And uh, yet it was awesome because Jay just didn't know what to get. And so he finally, he decides on a, on a, uh, a fried rice. And, and then uh, I think his pride got the best of him because the lady goes, you want low, medium, or, or very spicy? And he looks at me and goes, can you eat spicy? I go, bro. Spicy is my middle name. Uh, he goes, give me the spicy. She goes, sir, are you sure? This is very spicy. And I go, now, ma'am, is it white people spicy or Thai people spicy? Yeah. She goes, no, sir, it's Thai people spicy. I said, bro, I can hang. He goes, I can hang. I got pictures if you want to see them. Let's just say the server couldn't bring enough napkins. <laughs> But you know, there's nothing worse than not knowing what you're going to order. I mean, Cheesecake Factory is a nightmare for me. I mean, how that company stays open with 5,000 options on their menu is beyond me. But not for me to decide, but it's when everyone else has taken half an hour to decide. But uncertainty is such a challenge. And yet within Christianity, there is so much uncertainty. So many churches that teach, hey, you don't have to live a different way. You just have to believe in Jesus. And you'll be saved. There are other churches that swing the pendulum and, and women aren't even allowed to come to church unless their hair is covered. That if you drink dark drinks like, like black tea or, or Coca-Cola, they think that's sin. Because anything dark has to do with sin. <clears throat> so much uncertainty within the religious community. And that's because there's so little conviction of what it means to be a Christian and who Jesus was. In John chapter 8, that's what we're going to look at today. The title of this morning's lesson is, Would the Real Christians Please Stand Up? Alright, we got one right there. Well, 
We're the most humble people in the world. Please stand up. Oh, Marvell didn't stand up for that one. All right. <laughs> means he's getting. It means he's getting there. Come on, bro. And, and, and during this time, there was a lot of uncertainty as to whether Jesus, who he was. And if he was a prophet, if he was the Messiah, there was a lot of uncertainty. And in John 8, verse 31, it says, To the Jews who had believed in him. And so Jesus addresses a crowd of people who acknowledge him as maybe not Messiah, because it was still a bit premature in his ministry, but they acknowledge him as unquestionably of God. And they believe in him. Much like many of us today believe in God. Much like many of us have come because we believe that, that this is where we should be. We believe that this is where we're going to be propelled in the direction that we want. And yet Jesus says here in verse 31, If you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Isn't freedom what we want? Isn't that what the United States is all about? Yeah. Liberty, freedom for all. Yeah. Yeah. And yet we see that freedom comes from the truth. And yet Jesus said, I am the truth. Jesus said, I am the word. See, today we're here to look at the truth. Why is there so much confusion within the religious community? Because there's so little truth. People's convictions don't come from the Bible. That's just the bottom line. They think they do. They think they do. They think that because they've paraphrased John 3.16 that their relationship with God is justifiable. And yet right here, Jesus goes, listen, you believe in me. That's good. But it's not enough. See, will the real Christians please stand up? What, what is a Christian? It's someone who's Christ-like. And we understand Jesus goes, listen, I am christ but I'm not Christ just because I believe I'm the Messiah. I'm Christ because I live a sinless life and I'm going to die on the cross for the sins of the world. And if you want to be like me, then you've got to be like that. He says, if you hold, hang on to my teachings. Kind of like Marvell out there with the donuts. He's hanging on right there. Even more than that, Jamel. You know, I walk up, I grab a piece of donut, and Jamel goes, bro, you gotta take the whole thing. I go, bro, I don't prescribe to your theology, bro. That's your third donut right there. Alright, don't impart your beliefs on me. You gotta hold on to it. He says, you've gotta hang on to what I've taught you, and if you do that, then you're really my disciple. See, people can say they're a disciple. The religious community, they've come up with this, oh yeah, I have this discipleship class, which is just a class that doesn't have anything to do with discipleship. He says, if you hold to my teachings, then you, you really are my disciples. See, we're not saved by, you know, flawlessly obeying the Bible. But a disciple is somebody who makes this the standard of their life. And it's hard to make something a standard if you don't know what it says. What does it mean to be a disciple? If you can't sit someone down right now and teach them... I'm not judging you. I'm just telling you, you're not a Christian. Because how can you tell somebody to be something? How can you tell somebody to be something that you don't know? Right. Being, going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Right. Believing in the Bible doesn't make you a Christian. Believing in Jesus doesn't make you a Christian. It's making the decision to make the Bible the standard of your life and to be Christ-like that makes you a Christian. And yet right here, Jesus says, if you do that, then you'll know the truth. And the truth will set you free. We live in such a subjective world, don't we? Man, people's morals are, are all over the place. You've got the, you have, you have the same-sex marriage. You have the transsexual movement. You have Black Lives Matter. You have all these different social movements. And yet, Why? Because there's no basic ground of truth. There's no source of truth. The Bible is a source. Look around you right now. This is not a, a black church. This is not a white church. This is not an Asian church. This is not a young church, old church. This is a church of disciples. Amen? For the real Christians, please stand up. Point number one. Be your best. 
by going back to the basics. Be your best by going back to the basics. You know, will the real Christians please stand up? But really, will the, will the theologians please sit down? Whoa. See, it's not, it's not being a philosopher or a theological scholar or a biblical expert that, that makes you a Christian. It's being able to stick to the basics. In 1 John chapter 5. Oh, here we go. Of course, we read John 8, and now we're reading 1 John, his epistle. And it, it, it segues quite well. And in chapter 5, verse 3, well, verse 1, it says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commandments. This is love for God. To obey His commands. Period. And His commands are not burdensome. I used to always look at the Scripture and go, yeah, i got to obey God, and it shouldn't be a burden. That's not what John says. He says, love for God is obey His commands. Period. It is not a burden to obey God. And yet I started to really dig into this Scripture, and I go, hmm. Obey God's commands. I mean, he can't be talking about the commandments of the Old Testament. Right? Why? Because John himself, throughout the book of John, the purpose of the book of John was to prove the divinity of Jesus, that he was God in the flesh. So surely John is not taking us back to a Mosaic law. I think it's very clear the connection he's creating is Jesus is God. Therefore, we have to obey the commands of Jesus. But then I thought further and I go, well, what, what are the commands of Jesus? And a lot of brothers, they, they started mentioning Scripture's teachings. But, but the word command in the Greek is entole, which means an order. It doesn't mean a prescription. It doesn't mean like, hey, do not lust. No, that, 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 that falls under a command. And right here he says, love for God is to obey His commands. And His commands are not a burden. So I began to think, well, what are the commands that Jesus gave? There's only three times Jesus ever gave a command. Let's turn to the first one in Matthew chapter 22. You know, what's great is that the first command that Jesus gives was not his command. He actually validates a command that God gave in the Old Testament. Matthew 22, in verse... 34, <clears throat> hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees. See, when you have the Bible, that's what you do. You silence religious hypocrites. Uh, yeah. The Pharisees got together, one of them, an expert in the law, but not the heart of the law, just the words of the law, wow. tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in Tole, order, in the law? This is the only law that Jesus ever validates and verifies to be held and obeyed. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And that's what's amazing is Jesus goes, well, the heart of the law can be summed up in these two commandments that I adhere to. To love God with everything you have. It's not a commandment that Jesus gave, but rather a commandment that Jesus validated that God had given. And he says, then there's a second command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, the second command of Jesus is that he starts by giving a command that God already gave, and then he segues into updating one of the commands. Turn to John 13. Command 2.0. If it was like Fast and Furious, there'd be like 13 sequels. In John chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus says, A new command in Tole, I give you love 
one another. Period. This is not the Constitution. There's no manipulation. Love one another. Of course, the word love agape, lay your life down for one another. He says a new command. Well, what's the old command? Love your neighbor as yourself. A new command I give you. He's taking what God had commanded, the heart that God had, and now he's helping them to see how it transitions into the covenant that he would bring them. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The second commandment Jesus gives is very simple. He says, I order, I command that you must love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. You think Jesus got bad attitudes? Yeah, he did. He got ticked at the apostles on several occasions. But you know what he didn't do? He didn't harbor it. He didn't go and talk to other people about it. He didn't hold it inside. He didn't become bitter and unforgiving. He dealt with it. Right? You got, of course, in Matthew 20, he's walking on the road. All right, guys, we're going to have an incredible service today. And he's walking, right? He's excited. He notices they're kind of back. And there's kind of like an argument going on. I'll address it later. He's like, I'm trying to stay focused. And people are coming in, you know, picking daisies. And he goes. And then they get there. And he goes, what, what were you guys talking about back there? And they go, oh, I mean, you know, nothing much. Just who, who can sit at your right and left? He goes, you have no idea what you're talking about. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? Of course we can. I take water any chance I get. It's hot out. I mean, who doesn't drink Gatorade these days? I'm not a fan of the melon flavor, but yeah, I'll drink it. Now, what's amazing is the other, uh, 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 the other gospel says that it was his mom that asked. Right? You know, it's not good when your mom has to make a call for you. Say, hey, you're sick. You can't go to practice. Can you call the coach and tell him? No, you call him. Oh, come on, mom. And yet, this, and yet Jesus, he didn't harbor it. Right? He, did, he, didn't, he didn't just hold it in. He brought it to the surface. Right? Why? Because conflict is part of a relationship. And we can't be cowards. When you have feelings against someone, you've got to bring it up. And guess what? My rule of thumb is simple. I don't care how ugly it gets. But I'm not leaving until it's done. Or you leave. I can't stop you from leaving. But I'm not leaving. And usually what happens is even the most hard-headed of people that we start a meeting at 4 o'clock in the evening and it's 2 o'clock in the morning and they go, you know what? This guy's not going to light up. All right. Let me have it. Just tell me what I need to change. And, and, and my heart is softened, but I, got, I can't stand for another hour. I go, okay. Ray may get ugly, but at the end of the day, I got to love as Jesus loved. And Jesus didn't fret from conflict. In love, he engaged it. He brought it up. Someone hurt his feelings, he brought it up. And Ray, he didn't go, oh, I'll just get over it. And then two months later, you're confessing it because you fell away. No, no, no. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And then he says, by this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. See, people may come in and visit, and maybe if you're visiting, you can understand where I'm coming from, and, and you start getting hugs. It's a little weird, right? Because when I grew up going, I grew up going to a church where there was 500 to 1,000 people, and I went there two hours early for a year. Not a single person ever got into my life and asked me how I was doing. And yet, you know, I came here the, for the first time, and I was, I was bombarded by hugs. And yet, what makes true love is not getting along. It's getting along. It's moving forward together of one accord. It's staying unified. It's staying on the same page. When there's something in our heart, we bring it up. Because that's what love is is. When Jesus was conflicted with dying on the cross, he went before God and he said, God, I don't want to do it. But it's not my will, but your will be done. Then he prays a second time, a third time, until he was ready. And I think in the same way, do you appreciate your heart? 
Do you respect yourself enough to keep your heart clean? Because really what it comes down to is the only person you're not respecting is yourself. Because bitterness only hurts you. I know for me, I've been hurt many times in my life. But you know, at the end of the day, the reason I forgive is because it's not worth hurting me. I'm not going to let someone hurt me again and again and again because I'm carrying it with me. I let it go. But we'll get to that in a bit. And yet the third commandment is in Matthew 28. Matthew 28 in verse 18. It's the last thing Jesus said. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Right here, the word, you look at it, you go, well, there's not a commandment right there, bro. But the word authority in the Greek is expousia, which means the ability to implement law. He goes, not only can I now give you commandments that are based on what God has commanded, but actually now I've been given all authority in heaven and earth to implement law, to implement commands. Paul's like, oh my gosh, like, get your pen and paper. He goes, no, 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 I just have one thing to say before I go. Love God, love one another, and this is the only thing left I have to tell you. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. You know, a good thing is you don't have to have an IQ of 160 or read or write to be able to remember what he commanded us to obey. Because he gave him the third and final commandment. He says, you need, you need to teach them to obey. Why? Because it's not easy to obey loving God. See, part of loving God means you got to be a man or woman of purity. Part of loving one another means you've got to forgive each other. Part of loving the lost means that you've got to love them more than you love yourself and your own comfort. He says, you've got to teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. See, a lot of people go, God is with me because God is with me. And that is true. But he goes, no, no, I'm with you because you're with me. I'm not chasing you down. You're chasing me down. See, we go, man, you know, God's with me. God's with me. No, no, no. When you're, when you're living the life of a non-Christian, God is not with you. And it's not because he doesn't want to be with you. It's because you don't want to be with him. You don't want to be with him. What kind of a husband would, would be upset with his wife for not being there for his adulterous relationship? Like, you don't want to go to lunch with me? No, that woman's going to be there. So you don't want to be with me. No, I, I can't be with you. I can't be with you. It's ridiculous. Right? It's, it's like, it's like a, an animal rights activist, Frank, going to a butcher's convention, and then the person being offended that the animal rights activist doesn't come with them. No, I'm not going to go because it's not, I can't go. It's not what I stand for. It's not my value. It's not that God doesn't want to be with you. It's that you go to the places where he can't go. You don't want to be with God. He says, but you've got to teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. To love God with everything you have. To love one another as he loved us. And the last one is to make disciples, not churchgoers, not flimsy, whimsy believers, but to make men and women who are Christ-like of all nations. Not an all-black church. Not an all-white church. Not an all-Korean church. Not, but a church of all nations and it's not meaning that we need to go out and look for people of an asian background no, no no what he's saying is that we need to plant churches in the asian countries and that's why in august we're planting a church in hong kong china but even in the united states you've got all types of, of americans you know you've got people of where i'm from from the northwest you've got you've got the southwest then, then you've, got, you've got the South, like Texas and Georgia and Atlanta. Right? Then you got the East Coast. You got some East Coasters in here. Right? And then, and then, 
and then you got the Midwest. How are you? You got the Midwest up in Minnesota, just under Canada. You got all types of Americans, and we got to get churches in Minneapolis. We've got to get churches in Atlanta. We got to get churches anywhere and everywhere because it's a command of Jesus. And yet, for the real Christians to stand up, you got to go back to the basics. How's it going with the basics? Are you loving God? See, as disciples, we love God. So we want to get into the scriptures. We want to pray. We don't have to, we want to. See, we, as disciples, we love one another. It can be challenging at times. People go, isn't it hard? It's not hard. It's challenging, but it's easy. You know why? Because it's sequential. Like John says in 1 John chapter 3 and 4, he says, if, if you don't love your brother, you cannot say you love God. Right. See, in order to really love one another, you have to love God. Right. You, can't, you can't love the people around you if you don't love God. How can you give forgiveness if you don't get it? Now, here's the kicker. You can't love your brother if you don't love God, but, but you can't love the lost if you don't love the kingdom. Yeah. You're going to bring something, somebody into something you don't love? See, if you're not elated to come to church on Sundays, it, it's going to become burdensome. The word burdensome in, in Hebrew or in Greek is heavy. It's going to be heavy. It's going to feel like you're lifting a load too heavy for you to lift. And the root issue, it's not because you're not capable of influencing people's lives. I look around and look at everyone and I go, wow, these are game changers. These are people who influence those they walk around. I look at Ariel, I go, wow, Ariel is somebody who, who, who pulls women into her life. Yeah. Right? You just meet her and you want to tell her about your story. Yeah. You just want to tell her how you're feeling. <laughs> right? You meet someone like Kevin. Okay. Right? Yeah, yeah. I just want to hang out more with this guy. Yeah. Just met him, but I just, I want, can I move in with you? <laughs> right? You meet, you meet someone like Paul Kelly with a mustache like that. I mean, come truth people are as open as your mouth is yeah. rd baker said that a men's maybe i was super impacted people are as an open as your mouth is you man people aren't open yeah because your mouth's not open but then i came to a final conclusion I go, you know what it doesn't matter if people are open does jesus say you know hey you got to go and and, and you got to just seek and save and be successful no he says you got to preach the word if they listen, they listen. If they don't listen, they don't listen. Right. I'm just not in an open area. That's a good conclusion, but who cares? <laughs> if there's one person of 20 million in the city of Los Angeles, the question is not are they open or not. The question is how long is it going to take you before you find them? Right. That's what we do as disciples. But guess what? To get to that heart, you got to love God. Yeah. And once you love God, then you can actually love your brothers and sisters. Yeah. It's not about you. Right. They hurt my feelings. Well, what about their feelings? What about their feelings? You don't care about their feelings? And then you can love the lost. And here's the last part. Then and only then you can actually love yourself the way you're supposed to. When you focus on yourself, you hurt yourself. That's the problem. A lot of us will go, man, I'm just, I'm not, you know, I just need to get me time. No, you need no time. <laughs> See, here's the reality. You're a sinner just like me. And the more time you spend with yourself, the more disgusted you're going to get with yourself. And so spend less time looking in a mirror at something you don't like and spend more time helping other people. Spend more time with a God who loves you. And so I'm excited because over the next three weeks, we're going to be doing a series called Back to the Basics. And so the first one is we're going to talk about loving God. And I'm excited because it was going to be on my lesson today, but I had to say, my, 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 I have a, a, a nugget for the decade. Okay. Wow. And I, I'm like fired up about it. But you're going to have to wait till next week to hear it. And then the following week, we're then going to go over loving one another. I got to be honest, guys. When I first came to the, to the West region, I got with every single disciple. I'll give you a preview into the lesson here. 
Every single disciple. And there were two types of disciples in the, in the West region. There are those who have been disciples for a while here, and there are those that have been recently converted within the last year. And I asked everyone two questions. I said, what do you love about the West, and what do you think needs to improve? You want to hear what everyone answered? All the older disciples said, the thing I love about the West is that it's family. I go, what needs to improve? They go, we need to be more joyful. Then I went to the younger Christians over here. I go, what do you love about the West? They go, I love the joy. <laughs> because, see, for the older disciples, they, they know where their joy should be. And yet for the younger disciples, they may have come into a less joyful group, but it's still so much more than what they had in their denominational church. And then when I asked them what needs to improve, you want to know what they said? They said, it doesn't feel like a family. And the bottom line is what came together is that the young Christians understood. They go, well, I mean, you know, this is more joyful than I've ever been, but I just didn't feel like family. The older disciples go, well, because we stuck around, we're family. That's not family. And we need to look at what it means to love one another as Jesus loved us. And then the last one is loving the lost. But I'm talking about really loving the Lord. I'm not talking about sharing your faith. I'm not talking about getting a visitor once a month. I'm talking about shedding tears over the women that were raped last night. I'm talking about shedding tears over the young men who had a pistol in their mouth because they want to kill themselves. These are real things, guys. People need us. They need God. And if we don't have a heart for them, no one will. No one will. We have the cure to something far greater than the cure to cancer. And you'd think that it's, it's, it's pragmatic. You'd think it's rational to just give it out freely. But the problem is, is that we, we fight to stay away from the spiritual cancer wards. We don't want to see the pain the world's in. And so we avoid it entirely. And we're going to get down to what it means to really love the lost. We're going to get back to the basics. When I think about getting back to the basics, I think of Ariel. Okay. You saw her getting restored. She was in tears. It was amazing because um, I saw her get baptized from a distance being in the West. And um, I met her for the first time. And I kind of gave her a hug. And it was kind of like, I was like, okay, you know. And, and, and I go, you know, she's, she's shy. I mean, you know, it's... You know, it's different being in the kingdom. And, and, but then as time went on, I, I saw that she kind of always opened up. But then I started to see, like, she started to pull back. I saw it from a distance to the point that she left. And yet what was amazing is that about a month ago, she came back to service. And in her own words, she felt like she wasn't really in a place where she wanted to get restored. And yet two weeks ago on Thursday, we sat down. And, and as we're looking through the scriptures, I'll never forget this. She just broke. Yeah. Just a and she just starts weeping. And she kept saying, I've just been so ungrateful. I've been so ungrateful for the kingdom, people that love me so much. And then she said, I've been so ungrateful for the Bible. And I think for Ariel, what I appreciate about you is that we come into the kingdom, then we bring our baggage with us. We bring our preconceived ideas. We come into the kingdom having been hurt. And Ariel's been hurt a lot in her life. And yet, not purposely, but we can innocently bring it in that the only time people loved us is when they were trying to take advantage of us. Yeah. And so we come into the kingdom, we go, wow, these people are determined to take advantage of me. Wow. And so we, we, get, we get guarded. Mm -hmm. And yet I think for her, she came in, then I think that because of the pain that she's been through, she's an extremely welcoming and accepting person. Right? But I think that part of that is that she associates acceptance except as she associated acceptance with love. And so she reached a point in her with God where she wasn't rooted in the word. And so as we began to dig into the scriptures and go out, if, if that person is not living like a disciple, they're not saved. It started to hit her because it felt unaccepting. But because she wasn't deep in the word, she then equated that to unloving, which was not true. And yet as she dug into the word on Thursday night, she just was broken. And, and she shared about just her ingratitude. She goes, the Bible's right there, but I don't read it. 
And she goes, you know what? At the end of the day, it's not about acceptance. It's not about love. If people choose not to read the Bible, if people choose not to live out the scriptures, it's not God's fault. It's not our fault. That was their decision. And it, it clicked. And it was awesome because you know when somebody's truly repented because you see a radical change. There's no such thing as repenting. Right? So repenting is when you're circumventing repentance. You're trying to go around it. But, but she repented, and I knew it because we got together Thursday, and then we got together on Sunday, or she, we came to church Sunday, four days later. I go, Aaron, it's great to see you. Just so joyful, excited, right? And uh, but I go, what have you been reading? She goes, oh, it's been awesome. It's, you know, since Thursday, I've been able to read almost the entire New Testament. Yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I, I mean, I got through, you know, half of the Gospel of Mark, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been so ungrateful for the Word, but so what did she do? She repented. And it doesn't mean that if she doesn't read the whole Old Testament by tomorrow night, she's in sin. But what it means is that she made a radical change. And I'm super proud of you. And so today she got restored. You know, I think about Matthew and Marla. I'm super grateful for, for the love of chess. I appreciate his communion as he shared. It's about, you know, coming to the West and... And come the new year, I mean, man, they, they, they came in punching. They were ready for some miracles. And, you know, it's one thing, you know, you take a hit and then you get back up, right? And then you take another hit and you get back up. And, and it, it's tough when you give your best and you're in the crucible and God is trying to teach you something. And it's painful because you don't know when you're going to get out. You're just there melted, waiting to be refined. <laughs> and yet what I appreciate is that, as he said, he's been, he had to battle discouragement. But I think sometimes we just give in to discouragement. And yet as disciples, we don't give in to discouragement. We battle it until we overcome. Until we overcome. Be it two times or 200,000 times. <laughs> Perseverance is not defined by how many times you go through trials and then overcome. It's defined by the ability to maintain through trials and never give up. And I have no doubt that a very fruitful time will be coming for the Love Chefs Bible Talk. The truth is, is that this is what we do as disciples. This is what we do. Right? We're not here for... A religious experience, though we may have a worshipful, worshipful time, we're here to change the world, yeah. starting with the West. And so right now, you look around you, there are empty seats. Let's fill them up. Let's not fill them up with churchgoers, let's fill them up with those that are looking for God. And let's show them who God is. Let's show them what it means to be a disciple. And it will be a battle. I know there are many here who are studying the Bible who are battling through things in their lives that they don't want to give up yet. My encouragement to you is, it's not worth hanging on to. If, if the five-year future version of yourself is able to come back and talk to you, the first thing they do is smack you. <laughs> for, for even just for thinking about not being a disciple. The idea of you not being a disciple and then the future amazing life they have, you'd have to turn the cheek. It'd be a simple time for your five-year future self because you'd be ticked off. They'd smack you. What are you thinking? This thing that's standing in the way of you having a relationship with God, it's, it's so minuscule. It's standing in the way of, of so many blessings. And the encouragement is to just do it. Repentance doesn't take procedure. It takes boldness. You go, well, what's going to happen? I don't know. You don't know. Only God knows. It's not repentance if it doesn't require faith. You just have to have faith and be sure of what you hope for in certain of what you may not see. See, I think for us guys, we have to make a decision. Because really, if we're going to be Christians that stand up for God, then we have to go back to the basics. And we have to escape the deception of our own perception. In John chapter 8, <clears throat> the deception of our own perception. Perception's a tricky thing, isn't it? Especially when you idolize your own opinion. Yo, man, I went, to, I went to give that person a hug, and they like, they didn't notice me. And then all of a sudden it turns into like this insane bitterness. 
you know, they didn't give me a hug because they don't love me. That's what it is. And then you come out and then I offer a piece of donut to Jay and you're standing there and I offer it to you and you go, this is wrong. And then you think that because you're crying in the bathroom because you're so hurt that it justifies what you're feeling. But now it's like, you've now fallen into what I call la pecada de la novela. <laughs> the Spanish figures know what I'm talking about. In the, in the Latin culture, you have a novela, which is like a, a Spanish soap opera, and it's like hyper emotional. It's like it's like you know it's like it's like someone takes a drink of your water, and they're standing up in the corner, and bitter that you took a drink of their water. It's just crazy, and it's the sin of the novela. <laughs> And it's just like, oh my gosh. But we can do that, can't we? Yeah. <laughs> but we can do that. And yet, our perception is our perception. It means that we're looking at something from one angle. But there's an infinity of angles. Infinity of angles. And the truth is, maybe, you know, I appreciate Marquesa. Yesterday we were at ICCM. And she, uh, I walked over and she goes, bro, I was trying to get your attention to say hi for like three minutes and... Like, I thought you saw me, you didn't say anything. I go, oh my gosh, sis, of course I love you. Of course, I didn't see you. Right? And, but the thing is, is that some of us would just walk off and not say anything. Right. Oh. And, and let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Because when you hit about 12 years old, you discovered something called entertainment. Be it Facebook or MySpace in my case. Oh. <laughs> Be it Facebook, be it Instagram, be it video games, sadly, be it something like pornography, be it sports, be it whatever. And the moment you started to feel sad, you would escape. You'd go on Facebook, you'd go outside and play sports, you would go punch a wall, you would, who knows what you would do. And the consequence is that you now come into the kingdom at 26 years old with the emotional intelligence of a 10 year old. Which means that when somebody hurts you or you feel hurt, you respond like a five-year-old, like a 10-year-old. <clears throat> and it's not because there's an extra sinfulness to you. It's because once you come in the kingdom, you're forced to deal with your feelings. Yeah. And one of the things that we can do when we're forced is we fall away. Yeah. Even if it's something like we were abused as a child. Right. It's, it's, it's a heinous thing, but what happens is you shut down. Yeah. And then for the first time you start to open up, my encouragement to you is there's nothing wrong with you you just have to mature emotionally. You have to learn that the, the, the best way to overcome your emotions is to never keep them to yourself. You've got to be able to put them out there. You've got to be able to find people that you trust. The word trust in Greek means to put your faith in. What does that mean? It means they're going to hurt you. But you put your faith in them. And if not them, in God. And, and you go, this is what I'm feeling. See, the biggest issue I don't feel like we find resolve is because we never actually get help on a heart level. We tell, people, we tell people the preview, uh -huh. but we don't, we don't let them see the full featured film. Okay. We tell them a, a little bit of it. Yeah, I just kind of felt hurt by that. But you didn't mention that, that, that that's what your dad used to do before he would abuse you physically. Yeah, right. You didn't mention any of that stuff. Right. And so you never actually find closure. Right. See, as disciples, guys, we cannot be eluded by our own perception right. because we're going to become deceived. And in John chapter 8, that's what happened to these Jews after Jesus spoke to them in verse 31. He says, if you're really my disciples, or he says, if you hold to my teachings, you're really my disciples, then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, what are the Jews thinking? We know the truth. We're the people of God. And so that's why in verse, 30, in verse 33, they say, they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say we shall be set free? See, they were deceived by their own perception. Interesting, huh? Instead of just listening to what Jesus said. See, these people believed in Jesus. But because they were blinded by their own perception, they did not see where they were at. Look what Jesus says. Verse 34. I tell you the truth. Usually we don't like the truth. He's about to tell them the truth, and this is why they crucified him. He says, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are ready to kill me, because you have no room for my word. 
I'm telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you do not, and you do what you have heard from your Father. He's about to get crazy here, but he says, look, I'm, I'm, I'm the Son of God, right? Only I have the ability to free you, and that's what I'm here to do. But you're blinded because you have no place for my word. See, sometimes we're set in our perception. We go, this is the way it is. And, and even though we're disciples, we don't even allow the word of God place in our mind. We can never do that. When the word of God comes out, you sit down and be quiet. And if somebody tells you something that's 1% accurate, you find the grain of truth in everything. Because that's what disciples do. We're teachable. It says, Abraham's our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, say, see, when you argue with Jesus, you get a pow pow. <laughs> if you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do the things Abraham did. As it is, you are determined to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the things your father does. We're not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Now comes the haymaker. It's about to get rough. Verse 42, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and now I'm here. I have not come on my own, but he has sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? You ever feel like you're talking to a disciple, and it's just like, you're speaking Mandarin or something like that? All right? I know, like, sometimes if I hurt, like, Colleen, and, I, and I'll be like, t take like eight minutes apologizing, right? And then I go, but babe, you feel like you're a little disrespectful. There's, you're not taking responsibility for your sin. <laughs> Why? Because she's hurt. It's how we are. <laughs> but right here, Jesus is going, you're not even hearing what I'm trying to say to you. And my wife's awesome. <laughs> he says, why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil. <laughs> It just got real. <laughs> and you want to carry out what your father desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? He who belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. <laughs> Flat brought the hammer. Because that's what Jesus does. And yet, as disciples, we're not children of the devil. We're children of God. Which means that our perception is aimed at one thing. The word of God and fighting for unity based on the word of God. Yeah. Where should we go to lunch? Who knows? But let's be unified. <laughs> if me and Michael Kirshner go out to do a Bible study, he wants Rubio's, I want Panda, so we end up sitting in separate places, and, and Horiel has to sit in the middle and hear us yell at him for the Bible study. That's not very encouraging. <laughs> right? Now, Mike will be encouraged because he got Rubio's. I'll be encouraged until I get the itis because I got Panda. But Horiel's not going to be encouraged. It's about, it's about holding to the word and being unified. What does it mean to be unified? It means that, that what we decide to do in holding to the word may not be what you want to do. That's okay because it's not about you. The world revolves around the sun, not your ego. And as disciples, we cannot fall victim to a deception of our own perception. We have to very simply go back to the basics. That's all. And that's the call of today. Let's go back to the basics. Love God, love one another, and love the lost. Amen. And as we do that, yeah. we will not only see our own lives changed, we will not only become the best version of ourselves, but we will be able to go out to reach and teach people whose lives will have been impacted eternally. Women that would have been sexually assaulted in 10 years from now will be married with children, with the husband of their dreams. Right? People that would have died from a drug overdose will end up being up here preaching like I am. Yes. We will change the course of history. Yes. But to do so, we got to go back to the basics. And so today, I've only got one desire, one plea. Would the real Christians please stand up?